Here's today's first word, daily devotion. On September the 14th, we enter a brand new day as we enter the realm of the Song of Solomon. Now, or the Song of Songs. So this is, of course, wisdom literature. And that means that we need to pay close attention to the genre or the type of literature that this this section of scripture is. Now, why does that matter? Because we have to really struggle to understand our interpretation. And especially in the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs, it's been a book that's been open for all types of different interpretation through church history. For example, it's usually thought about uh, the relationship between God and Israel. Or some have thought this book about Christ and his church. Or maybe you've been to a marriage conference before, and maybe you've heard sermons about marriage concerning the Song of Solomon. But I think that there is a broader way that we can think about the Song of Solomon. You say, well, what's the broader way? Because sometimes the language of the Song of Solomon is is that language that we uh, never hear in youth group or uh, sort of avoid. It's almost erotic. And so How can we then understand the Song of Solomon? Well, remember, context is everything. And when we are learning to read the Bible, we're learning to read the Bible in a particular context. And we have said before, the context by which we're reading the Bible is a canonical context. And that is, the whole canon from Genesis to Revelation becomes the primary context by which we develop our interpretation. And so why does that matter? Well, that then tells us that before we read our over-sexualized or hyper-sexualized readings of, of, of this language uh, into the text, we then take it as a canonical context first. You say, what do you mean? Well, remember the intention of the canon, the intention of Holy Scripture, is to show us the Messiah. It is God's words of salvation as he deals with his people through time and space. It's how he deals with them and the promise of indeed how he will deal with his people. And so the context of the Song of Solomon is a messianic context. And there we have our understanding of Song of Solomon uh, a little fuller, we should say, or more full than just simply talking about God and Israel or Christ and the church or marriage and love. And so we then ground our interpretation of the Song of Solomon in a hope in the Messiah. And so in this particular case, Solomon, he's going to equal Christ or the Messiah. And the lover is then personified as wisdom. And so in other words, all through reading the book of the Song of Solomon, there is this anticipation. There's this anticipation that builds. There's never consummation in the Song of Solomon. Instead, there is this burning anticipation. So what has been lost, that which we are to try to seek, is wisdom. Remember in the Garden of Eden, this is important for the way we understand the Song of Solomon. In the Garden of Eden, we substituted wisdom for knowledge. We substituted God's ways for our ways. Ecclesiastes, of course, was a picture of that, where we interpreted the world. We saw how the world can be interpreted very negatively if man's wisdom apart from the fear of God is all that we have. And so in the Song of Solomon, we have the Messiah pictured as a lover. And who is the lover that he is seeking after? The lover is wisdom. And of course, then wisdom becomes That which is, as we've learned through Job, more desirable than uh, than, uh, riches and long life. And this, of course, becomes our reasoning for understanding the Song of Solomon. In its canonical context, the reason it's in the Bible is not to give us a chapter on love. No, we have that in 1 Corinthians 13. And, of course, there are principles, of course, that we can gather from this wisdom literature as it relates to relationships and longings and all the rest. But its primary purpose is to show us the hope that we have for the Messiah to come and the desire that he has for wisdom. So you notice, for example, there's these footnotes that we have in our ESV Everyday Bible. Footnote number three here. We have on this page, uh, page 958. Wow, 
Can you believe that you have read 958 pages so far this year? Look at you. Good for you. But you notice that there is, it says she, and then others, and then she, and then he, and then others. And you'll notice that the translators have provided that for us. And of course, that means that it's not original. It's just the translators of the ESV trying to help us make sense of the different stanzas of this poem. So let's begin. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Verse 3, For your love is better than wine, your anointing oils are fragrant, your name is all poured out, therefore virgins love you. Verse 9, I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. Chapter 2 and verse 1, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Now, look at verse 3. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. Now, that apple tree there, I'm going to go ahead and give you a clue. That's Genesis language, and we'll see this again uh, at chapter 8 of the Song of Solomon. And I will make sure to make mention to that because that's really how we understand wisdom and its pursuit and how mankind lost wisdom. As Milton put it in Paradise Lost, They lost wisdom when they took the forbidden fruit, which of course Milton says was an apple. And where did he get that from? Well, I believe he was reading the Song of Solomon. But let's skip ahead. I hope that you'll be able to see verses 8 through 15. I have them marked in my Bible. And of course, because of the time, we're just not able to get to it. But we'll continue to to look at the Song of Solomon. And we're understanding the Song of Solomon is a messianic letter. And so the Song of Solomon is going to teach us to hope in the Messiah. Now, let's turn to then, let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. Now, let me say something, and I don't have time to say something, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm sure that some of you were probably wondering, how is he going to deal with the Song of Solomon? Well, hopefully this is not flattening out the Song of Solomon. Hopefully this is having you appropriate the Song of Solomon, what I believe, and this is John Selhammer and his influence coming out uh, is the way that the author intended the Bible to be read messianically. And so for those of you who are wondering, how's he going to deal with the Song of Solomon? Well, I'm going to deal with the Song of Solomon as an anticipation for our hope that the Messiah is going to bring. Philippians chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always again. I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then, of course, we have what to think on, which is important as we are thinking through the way we think as it relates to the Scripture, especially Song of Solomon. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, pure, lovely, commendable, there is any excellence, there's any worthy of praise, think on these things. And of course we end today in the Proverbs. And here we have verse 17. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. And how can we be assured that there is a future? Well, Song of Solomon is gonna tell us. There is this king who has secured wisdom, who takes us beyond knowledge, the knowledge that we acquired that led to death, the knowledge that we acquired that led to our shame, the knowledge of the good and evil. He supplements our knowledge with wisdom. And it's wisdom that we fear God. It's through wisdom that we fear God And it's by wisdom that we learn to live in a way that pleases God.